so we had the conversation and, um, you know, I was talking to the uh, occupational health department and it was, it was interesting to talk about this concept of, you know, some stores are requiring the mask, the cloth mask. And, you know, so now we were required for our employees who've been here for 10 or 12 or 20 years. It definitely wasn't anywhere in their job description. It's never been something we've required them to do in the past. And sure, at a basic level, we can require them to wear it. Um, but what happens when someone, you know, the one or two percent that may have a legitimate issue, a health issue with wearing it, um, you know, and their, her, her initial knee-jerk response was, well, they'll just have to go on FMLA or they'll have to, you know, take leave or, or something like Can we really say that or like how far do we need to go to work around this concept of, um, you know, the fact that it's a cloth mask is a piece of clothing versus something with a protection factor, part of a respiratory protection program. We, had, we ended up going down a, to her credit, man, she did really well with me going way out here and putting out all these hypotheticals and, and just talking through the concept of having this person in front of us that, um, that has these, you know, legitimate concerns. So that was a, that was an interesting conversation that you, when you were talking about talking to the lawyer, that reminded me of the conversation we had. Uh, yeah. And, and the, the CDC has some guidance on that, um, has a little bit of guidance on that. Uh, and our state, 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 state of New Jersey, it seems as though every, uh, reopening type executive order has a, uh, a facial covering, a face covering requirement that's part of it. And it always has a carve out for people who have medical conditions or for whatever reason cannot wear a mask. Um, so, uh, so we, and it's not, you know, we make, we make the, the, the point over and over again that it's not personal protective equipment, but it's still required it's it's in the policy we now have a pol an actual policy for for face coverings and and we've put that that carve out in the policy but it's not something that would be tied to you know, losing your job because you couldn't wear a face covering yeah thankfully uh, for us the face covering under cdc is you know it's it's it, it, depending on how you interpret it it's been considered voluntary you could make it out of different kinds of fabrics so for us, we don't consider that as respiratory protection, so we don't worry about the, the beard, right? Yeah, don't um, worry. It's, yeah. A, it's the other areas where we require respirators that it becomes an issue, so. That is definitely why the conversation started, because I was asking her if I was gonna need to shave down at any point, or if it came up and, and she was involved in the decision, what would she say? And she said, no, I, I think it's fine, you know? So I, I felt really uh, okay mm -hmm. and safe right then. I, I mean, if somebody, if it really came up, I'd probably just shave it off just to, um, just to be part of that, um, you know, uh, that integrity of, of what we do in safety, just to be like, you know, what, what really matters here? Um, but you know what you could do? You could shave it off and then maybe sew it into an actual cloth face cover. It's pretty long. <laughs> right, so have, right. So I have, to share with the... you, I have to share with you the first of the, of the like, manufactured face, uh, cloth face coverings that we were able to purchase and obviously did oh. not use as you can, you can, you can see me right through it. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty bad. It's in that range of protection factors, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So you know what's pretty, oh, sorry, real quick. This is pretty tough, but we, when we were rushing to get this done, we bought these, you know, gator-like type things. Problem is, is that they're single ply. So, you know, CDC says they should be double, multiple, multiple layers of fabric. So now we're getting flack for people wearing these. So it's always something, you guys. <laughs> well, that's, that's part of that conversation, too. And I think that, like, the example that I expressed, and you were talking to the lawyers, this whole thing where we have to treat it as a moving target and be okay with that. And, and that it's that constant flexibility that we need in there. Um, and, and so when people come across it on either side as, as always or never or, or polarized on either way, I try to caution them that we all need to be in the middle right now and just kind of moving together in the direction we're going. So very fluid very yeah. dynamic all right guys so we are here at 305 so we're gonna go ahead and kick right off into the webinar uh just a quick announcement thank you to everybody for joining us here and uh we have a very exciting cast of people here on today to talk about uh this upcoming topic and communicating with leadership during tough times uh just a brief set of just um basic information Zoom webinar has a Q&A function that you can go ahead and use for discussions. That's different than the chat in that chat, better for just saying hello, talking about you know, offside topics, but Q&A will be things that we'll be using to answer your questions 
towards the end of the webinar. So you can go ahead and thumbs up questions that you like. We'll be using that to help guide us towards the questions that people are more interested in. And you can also respond to each other's questions and that way you can have side conversations and increase the amount of information flow between everybody here and uh, just kind of increase and get better conversations going, which I'm certainly very excited to see. So we've already got a few people using the Q&A feature. Thanks to everybody for posting here. And uh, please go ahead, take a look at that, keep an eye on it, thumbs up questions you like, and we'll be using that to help us identify things. So just a brief bit about today's webinar. Uh, this is something that we have been thinking about for a while, with everybody suddenly being thrown into this work from home situation, suddenly going from in-person meetings to e-meetings in a situation where many of us may not have been familiar with that medium, going to video and voice calls and not having all of the in-person quick conversations. Communication can be really hard and there's also a global pandemic happening. So it's uh, a lot of need for new information and for communication. So the question then becomes, how do we do that well? How do we do that better? Uh, how do we avoid over communicating and also under communicating? And we have here with us today, three really fantastic speakers from across environmental health and safety. And they are going to be talking about their experiences, their advice, and uh, answering your questions about what we can do to help each other and just generally communicate better. So we've got a nice little quote from everybody here. They very kindly sent that over to me out of their busy days to have up here as we are chatting, just have something for you to read and kind of ingest as we go through our topics here today. And uh, we'll just do a quick round the horn, starting with David. Uh, David, if you could give me a brief overview of your role, a uh, little bit about your organization and how you guys have responded, just you know, very quick to get everybody introduced to you and then we can jump into the questions. Sure, I'm David Gillum. I'm the Senior Director of Environmental Health and Safety. I've only been in this job for uh, six months or so. Leon Egress was my predecessor and he retired last year. And after a national search, I was uh, I obtained it. I'm also the president of uh, the American Biological Safety Association. So if you don't know anything about that group, uh, I suggest you check it out. A little bit about ASU. We're one of, if not the largest uh, public university in the United States. We have some competition year to year in the top five, but we're always up there. Um, and uh, we've been we've been we got hit really quickly. We'll talk about this, I'm sure, in my talk. And we move fairly rapidly to online. We you know, canceled our entire semester and went entirely to online uh, in the spring. And it's just been tons of fun since then. And uh, <laughs> that's about it for right now. So we'll talk more uh, as we go. Uh, JP? Hey guys, uh, I'm the manager for research support services at Moffitt Cancer Center. We're a top 10 uh, cancer center. Think uh, MD Anderson, but much smaller in scale. Um, so we have uh, to be a, a, a NCI designated uh, cancer center, uh, comprehensive cancer center, you have to have a research institute. So my main role is in the research institute, but we always have that clinical side, which is new for me. I, I definitely come from the university setting. Um, so when this all hit, we had uh, you know the, the same things y'all felt on the research campuses. Uh, we felt here on our research side, but then we had the the part that, that pays for our research had some major issues that we had to try to work to overcome. And I've seen articles recently about um, the number of patients and uh, uh, screenings and, and diagnoses that were delayed by how much we had to lock down. And uh, we're really starting to see that in the surge of patients. We're, now we're having you know more surgeries than we did uh, uh, a year ago at this time because they're trying to catch up and, and all the stuff they kind of built up. So it's been an interesting uh, time for our role here. Um, we do uh, research environmental health and safety and I have some operations responsibilities uh, under my group. So it's a little bit of a, a interesting combination. Okay. And Robin. Hey, um, I am the executive director of environmental health and safety at Princeton University. And uh, my, my group is responsible for all your regular environmental health and safety topics, um, but we also have um, emergency preparedness. Um, and for the pandemic, I am the incident commander for the university. So that's been fun. Uh, it's been a, a major challenge, but um, uh, and it's been keeping us, of course, very, very busy. But um, so, um, so uh, have that role in addition to trying to manage um, environmental health and safety um, as well. I am um, also the uh, chair of the American Chemical Society Division of uh, Chemical Health and Safety. 
And so that that's a, that group also has been, um, you know, trying to be a resource for uh, for people, particularly in restarting laboratories and research. Um, so, and I've been at Princeton for 27 years, um, and I've been in this role since, uh, for the last seven years. Fantastic. All right. Well, I am really excited to hear uh, everybody's thoughts here, and uh, without any further ado, we can get started. So I want to do a quick round the horn here, uh, asking the same question to all our panelists to hear their feedback. Robin, I can start with you. So one question here to kick it off is, how do you determine if something is important enough to bring to somebody in a leadership position? Yeah, um, it's a that's a it's a real challenge, of course. And I think it just certainly my answer to that has changed a bit over the you know, over the course of this uh, this pandemic, just because the things that the things that leadership wants to know um, are different now than they than they were before. Um, but I, I think that I, I always find that there are some there are some things that I feel that there needs to be an institutional decision about something. Something is has enough consequences that this shouldn't be a uh, an issue that 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 me or my staff should be creating in a vacuum, um, because um, and, and and when that happens, that those are the sorts of that, that's one of the measures for me wanting to bring that to leadership. Um, sometimes they'll come back and say, hmm, well, it's 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 fine, just you make the decision, we're okay with it. Um, but and other times they um, that they, they do want to be part of um, of that discussion. But you know, really thinking about the implications. If something, um, what kind of, what, what is the response going to be? Who, who is, who is this impacting? And, uh, and, and if there's, and sometimes, you know, what is the level, you know, should, what is the level of credibility that our office has with that, for that particular topic? Um, so there's a, there's a number of factors that need to be there. Also, I, I always will go and, <clears throat> excuse me, go up for management if I think that, that, uh, that other people out would, would likely go to them and ask questions. I never want them to feel like they're gonna be unprepared for something, for something that this is the first time they're hearing about it. So if I have any indication, any concern that that, that might happen, I wanna make sure that they are as prepared to uh, be able to manage those questions and those issues as possible. So those are a couple of measures. Uh, JP? Uh, yeah, I definitely think, uh, obviously, uh, we're going to have some similar and uh, some crossover here. I think Robin's got it down right. You got to know if, if somebody might come up to him and ask him about it, you want to give him a heads up, mm -hmm. at the very least. Um, to, to that end, I think, uh, you know, I'd say almost everything that's an issue will eventually reach the leadership. It just depends on which bucket. So I like to put the different buckets. Uh, does it go in a, a bucket of, well, this could end up in a quarterly report somewhere or a long list of things that happen that if they want to read through, they can um, and maybe uh, use the layers between me and the vice president or the center director uh, to, to triage some of that. So if my director sees one of these, they may say that's going to be something that, that the VP wants to, to see and they can, they can call it out. Um, but if it's one of those red alert type issues where, uh, you know, they need to know immediately, um, then I would bypass that kind of thing. But it's, if it's not red alert, if it's not, we need center director VP uh, attention on this immediately and then a top down response approach. I like to build a, a set of people around me, uh, like Robin was talking about. So the research safety committee, for instance, is co-chaired by me and a faculty member. So that's an obvious person I can reach out to to try to get some sense of um, perspective on it uh, and to, to try to, so it's not just me coming. If it's just me coming, then they know it's a red alert issue. Um, but otherwise, it'll be a, a set of a few people. And sometimes that conversation you know, keeps it from having to go to the highest levels of leadership. Uh, but a lot of times that conversation will kind of flesh out what's really important in that concept of brevity, right? And come going to the uh, the leadership with directly what we're going to need and, and a little bit of work done on it um, uh, is, is important. I really like to work on, on you got to develop it because you can't necessarily do it at first. If you don't have it right now, it's going to take some effort. But if it's just a, oh, this is important because JP said that either gets old or, or it can kind of, kind of wear out um, uh, the, the traction on, on those things. And uh, David, anything for you? Yeah, I, I'm going to answer it a little bit differently. So I have fairly new staff. We've done a complete reorganization, and I have 
people who've been around for quite a while, as well as some people who are fairly new in the role of leadership. And I was noticing I was getting incredibly different uh, requests from these different leaders in terms of what they thought I needed to know. And so I worked with them, and as a leadership team, we came up with this plan that there was this, you know, green, yellow, and red kind of scenario of if it's green, they can handle it within their group. They don't need to elevate it. If it's yellow, they need to deal with it in their group, but also with their peers in the same leadership area. And if it's red, it's something that they deal with it with, that, with their peers, and then they elevate it as well. So it sort of was this cascading system to determine is this really something I can handle? Am I empowered to do it? Or is it something that I need to elevate above? And so I, I use a similar, not quite the same approach for my boss, but I know my boss is overwhelmed. I know, especially with the COVID, I think all of us are overwhelmed. And so I think about it from different angles. So is there going to be a legal issue involved with this? Is there going to be a news or PR related matter? Is there going to be something that from an employee point of view, someone's going to go and talk to them about it? Is it something that, from, as Robin said, an institutional issue that's going, to, that's going to be problematic? I think that you have to develop your own system for what works for you. But for me, it's whether or not it's going to impact the institution as a whole. So back to what Robin said. But I think it's hugely important that every single person who, no matter where you are in your leadership career, you think through, what, what am I empowered to do? What can I do? What can I work with my peers to do? And then what, can I, what do I actually need help to do? The one other thing I'll just tell you real quickly is my, my boss says, if you come to me with a problem, you better have three solutions. So, you know, that slows you down going to your boss. Sometimes you want to make sure that you've really thought it through and you have the solutions before it doesn't, you don't want it to become their problem, right? It, it may be their problem, but you want to give them solutions. So that's the other piece of that that I'll offer. Yeah. And also to build off of that, it demonstrates that you've really thought this problem through, you've done some work and it makes it easier for them to say, Hey, looks like you really got this under control. Go ahead and take care of that. Thank you. And uh, it makes you more valuable there. If I, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah. That's correct. Great. So uh, before we move on, just in terms of Q&A thing, I'm seeing a few questions here that are about sort of technical safety things. And if we have time for that, we may be able to get to those and address them. I think those are a great opportunity for everybody to answer each other's questions. And to keep things on topic on the communication side, I thought it might be a good idea if people were comfortable sharing some of the challenges they were facing in terms of uh, problems that they're overcoming, places where they may not be feeling heard or where they have concerns that aren't being met. Uh, Post those with you know as much detail as you feel comfortable sharing into the Q&A, and we may be able to workshop that around our panel and see what advice they may have for you to overcome some of those challenges. And to kind of build off of that, David, I'm going to give you another one here. Uh, so from our conversations ahead of time, it seems like ASU uh, reacted very early to the emergence of coronavirus. Uh, so referencing your experience is um, making your concerns heard very early on in that sort of initial outbreak phase. Uh, what would you recommend to somebody who believes they're seeing a major issue or something that's a real problem, but it's not being given the amount of uh, diligence or attention that it might deserve? Well, I'll give you the example of, yeah, you, I, I, we, I think all of us started to see cases in the U.S. or hear about it in China back in early, uh, mid-January mid or so. And so we were in communication with our health services and at the same time they were going, well, I'm not sure, we're not sure, we're hearing the same thing, but we're not sure it's a concern. And the more on a daily basis, we started to hear more and more about COVID and, and the potential uh, pandemic that was coming our way, we, we started pushing the administration. We got together our, our Emerging Infectious Diseases Committee to, to talk through like, hey, is this something we really need to be considering? About a week passed, we said, yes, it is. And we need to get a, a group together and we need to have a, a workshop. That happened on January 25th. It was a Friday. I think it was a Friday, but I remember the day. We rushed, we had a four hour uh, panel. We invited all kinds of folks from our incident response, our police, our health services, as senior leadership. And the next day, so it was a huge success, right? Everyone was like, this is great, we're amazing. The very next day we had our first case in Arizona. And so from my perspective, I was just happy we were having a conversation and we had done a drill. That way we could respond really quickly. Now granted, so much has happened since then. Like we're talking, you know, we didn't go straight to Zoom. We were able to isolate, and that person didn't actually, we, to our knowledge, didn't spread the disease. They lived with someone, didn't spread the disease. 
And we thought we had it under control, but it, immediately we started thinking about supply chain. How are we going to deal with personal protective equipment? So the message about um, how do you start with something, right? You have to be persistent. You have to think through what the problem is and then be persistent. You need to make sure that the right people are listening to you. You're communicating with people who can actually, you know, I didn't go straight to my boss. Um, I went to the groups that I thought would be influential to help communicate and explain the problem, explain the issue. And then we went to, the, to, to our boss and senior leadership. So I think it's a process. I think you have to think through who are your allies, who's going to support you. How, how can you explain it in a very succinct way? Because talking about a virus to somebody who would never heard about it before and they're not a life scientist person, you have to have all that thought through on how you communicate. So, so I think you just have to do your research. You have to get your friends and the people who can help um, best articulate what the issues are and work with them as a team. Be collaborative and then present, present it and then move forward. So th I, would, I would say that the experience I had that is a perfect example of a process in dealing with something incredibly difficult. I would just really quickly like to say currently my biggest concern is distribution of personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies to reopen our university on August 20th. Uh, I say this publicly here. I don't think it's going to be a problem. I think we'll have it under control. But in safety, when you start to think about students going to a classroom and not being able to access supplies, you start to get a little nervous, right? You want to make sure that you're protecting uh, someone's child or their, you know, family member. So, in in the world that we live in, I think we always are consistently thinking like, what's going to happen next? What's the next problem going to be? And how can we we be ahead of the curve? So, so anyway, that's uh, that's what I'll say. Great. And I'd just like to give uh, JP Robin if you'd like to jump in and respond or build off of that before we move on. I, mean, I think he covered it, it wonderfully. It was I was actually taking some notes on on some of it. It's very good. It's good to hear that experience. Yeah, I give think me a call that, if you want to talk. <laughs> Robin, did you want to jump in quickly? No, or? that's okay. That's okay. Go I'm sorry, okay. Robin. No? no, great, Robin. The next question is actually uh, for you. Okay. So. Uh, this is about duplicating efforts. So this is something that I think we've all experienced uh, during this COVID response. It's one of the reasons that we have this webinar series is to help people find those folks who have already gone down the road they're trying to go through and find the solutions they've already found and just advance the speed at which we come to best practices and new ideas. Uh, what's been successful for you in preventing this uh, issue of duplicating es efforts across maybe different task forces across, for instance, uh, EHS department just otherwise COVID response. So is there any advice that you'd give to people uh, who are in working groups who are late and like these task force um, yeah. where they want to avoid duplicating efforts? Yeah, so I think one of the one of the big challenges that we've had that I've had with this particular, you know, I've, I've been We've had a number of uh, different public health type emergencies, some of them even longer term public health emergencies on our campus uh, and other like uh, big, big uh, emergencies on campus. This one, it was one of the things different about this, and I'm sure all of you listening are here are, are experiencing the same kind of a thing, is that, that a lot of people were, a lot of different groups were trying to create their own plans, do, do their own thing, kind of in silos. And, uh, and then we'd find out about it a little bit later, or maybe it wasn't in the silo. Maybe somebody from, uh, from the senior administration or someone else said, I want you to be working, um, I want you to be working on this thing. Um, and uh, and what what was happening though is that there, there that usually within you know in emergency management in any good management you want to make sure that that there is that every group has a group that is supporting them that is that is that they are that they are reporting up through that there's some kind of a connection among among all of them and you and you should know for each group how does that group fit into the broad. The, you know, the broad scope of what we're trying to do. And I could see that that was um, not, that, that we were having some problems with that. Uh, and the result of it was that people were duplicating efforts and people were starting to duplicate efforts. People were, we weren't seeing consistency. The types of the way that they wanted to do something was, was, uh, was, um, it was the opposite of the way that another group was trying to do something and we needed that consistency um, as well. And what was really helpful was 
was that I just, I went out and try and got all of the, um, learned, you know, at, uh, reached out to every single group that I could know about, that I had heard about, um, you know, made sure that I had, uh, knew who was leading the group, exactly what they were working on. Um, and that, and what I did is created a, a table and a, an org chart, a series of org charts to show how they all fit in and to highlight the ones that didn't have, that didn't seem, seem to fit into the org chart where I thought they should be, and then shared that around with every single group and the leadership. And what that did is that it began, it, 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 it stopped, it stopped things. Um, you know, if someone thought, okay, we need to figure out how, whether the art museum is going to be able to open to the public. Um, rather than uh, doing that, those questions in a vacuum, they were then coming to the right people to say, we need to explore this question. How do we do this best? Where do we fit into that organization? How do we make sure we're being consistent throughout and that we're not, uh, uh, you know, and, and so that was really helpful. And what I found is that, and, and I find this with, with, this with a lot of things with, when it's things that are complicated or that are complex, is that sometimes people need that visual and the and it, the table was helpful. I color coded it to show you know who was part of what um, for that. Um, but seeing that structure made a huge impact. And people were getting frustrated because you know why you know why isn't this thing happening so fast? If I it's, I all I have to do is pull up that chart and it shows that there are more than 25 different teams working on different aspects of things for the summer, for the fall, for the operational response. And so, could, so this was so. Look at this system, you know. Understand that there's that these are a lot of moving parts, and um, and and it's been that's been really effective, both in communicating it up and down, um, and, but also for avoiding that duplication. Great. Uh, JP, David, you like to respond? I'd say that we definitely uh, we definitely had this pain point. Uh, we've definitely spent, you know, as David alluded to, like everybody's pushed to the limit right now. So there was definitely frustration when at the first couple of things where we found out that we had duplicated some effort, and then the people that it made sense to be taking care of something, you know, we could defer to them. Um, being a support services group, we supply support services of core competencies within research, you know, health and safety, common equipment, uh, glass wash. Uh, facility coordinators, but then there's an institutional level of support services, which is the straight up facilities, environmental services. And there were some things that, you know, in hindsight, and we're trying to learn from it as we go, but in hindsight, it was like, yeah, it really does make sense for you know, environmental services to take care of that. Um, but part of our, our thought that we should take care of it was we were really deferring to the clinical side, like, oh, the clinical side needs them more. Um, but, but what overcame it was, like Robin said, it, just, it was a chance conversations uh, across those silos um, that overcame that. So I think Robin hit it, hit it on the head, and that visual is, uh, is a very human-centered uh, solution to that. that was the kudos to you, Robin. That was awesome to hear about. I, I think I would just say that uh, we have about over 20,000 employees, and we have hundreds of departments and everybody wants to do the right thing, right? Everybody, every college wants to make plans and every, every group is, is, has a piece of the puzzle, right? Every, every school is going to have to come up with a plan for their school. Every department ideally will have their own plan for their own unit. And we found that there is a lot of overlap in a sense, but it's also good. It's good to have these people doing their own things. they they have something to do, first of all, and it doesn't mean I have to do everything for them or the university has to do everything for them. Uh, but the, the challenge then comes now, and we're do, dealing with this now, is like a, creating a guidance document, an FAQ for people. How do you answer questions across the entire university when all these different groups have, have made their own plans? And so that's the way we are dealing with it is that we have key stakeholders in all these different areas, and we, it's a so it's a it's a lot of work, but we're we're distributing questions to them. They're answering them, and we're reformulating them into a a nice nice product for our faculty, staff, and students and visitors when they come back. So, I I I, I don't 
while I would love it if all of us could be working together on the same page and we weren't having redundancy, I do see value in it in different ways. You also get creativity that way. You may hear something from a different group that you never would have thought of. Mm. So I, I see the pros and cons. I would love to have what Robin had, but I don't know if it would work for us. So that's what I would say. Yeah, I personally am a huge fan of whenever possible getting into these really cross disciplinary conversations because I think a lot of times you say, oh, I have this problem I've been hammering away at for months. I just don't know what to do. Here's, I can describe it really accurately. I can talk about what I need, but I just don't know how to solve it. And then you have somebody from a totally different area that says that, you know, we solved that. That's a, you know, textbook thing for us. We got to take care of that 10 years ago. And uh, there's uh, amazing value to be found there. So uh, just... Last question here for JP before we move on to the live Q&A portion of the webinar. JP, how do you avoid being seen as alarmist while still holding to professional responsibility to protect others and the environment? I think we're all pretty used to and a little bit tired of this whole, you know, okay, EHS, like health and safety, calm down. You know, we get it. You don't want people slipping or falling. Uh, and getting dismissed like that is very challenging when you're trying to really protect people's health. So what have you found is effective there? And I, I love my, my safety uh, uh, peers who are super passionate about, um, you know, this is a hazard and we don't want anybody getting hurt. Um, that messaging, I've, I've found that if you vary the messaging um, enough and help the people understand that, and don't always come from the side of, oh, this is, this is the next catastrophe, this is the next uh, death, or this is the next uh, major accident. Um, you get a little bit of more traction as well. It, sometimes you want to you want to avoid uh, turning them off from the beginning because it sounds like oh this is something that people always say is going to happen but it never does. The flip side of that is that's the stress I feel like we deal with all the time is that um, our successes are borne by the fact that nothing happened. Um, so I'd say what what I try to do and what I'm trying to do at, at Moffitt is to start the framing of this conversation around the concept, a concept that's separated from, uh, you know, the risk of loss or the risk of injury or separated from regulation standards and best practices. Um, but this, this concept of operational integrity, and uh, I, I got it from a, another company uh, within their report, but it seems to fit what we're doing at, at Moffitt where we have research health and safety in a group that's also managing operational issues. Uh, because when you think about it, uh, how, what we do in health and safety is is some somewhat related to what they do in quality, um, somewhat what they and and production and doing things the right way um, as a as a part of your values. Uh, I think you 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 can frame the conversation in a way that it's not always about um, the scare tactic of well if we don't do something about it this is what's going to happen. Um, so I, I think as you as you go, you try to build the constant conversation. You try to build uh, a, an extra, external con, um, concept of like an operational integrity, um, and it, under that we can talk about the risk of to life and limb. We can talk about um, the risk of regulatory fines or uh, or judgments against that, um, and then the standards and the best practices. And it gives you kind of a, a safe area to talk to, so you don't always have to go to this area of um, oh, this is going to cause a major problem. I can't believe something hasn't already happened yet. Um, and then you, you tie it to quality. You get some people in there, you know, like you were talking about, Matt, that have worked on some of these problems, uh, and they, they come at it from a different perspective. So you have those allies um, that can help you bring up these issues in a way that, that uh, it's not always about, oh, we've, we've identified this major hazard, and, and we feel like somebody's getting hurt. Um, and that's why you need to listen to me. Uh, Robin, David, is there anything you'd like to add there? Sure. Um, I, 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 but all, all that JP was talking about is just spot on. Um, I would just add that um, that that sometimes it's it can be difficult to try to find that balance between you know um, fear and uh, you know making sure that people understand that this is important, but uh, but not you know finding that balance with fear and. Uh, from a public health standpoint, this came up a lot when we were was dealing with a, an outbreak of uh, meningitis B. And our first, way, first, we didn't want to scare people too much. And the language that we used was just so mild that people just didn't take it seriously. They thought, ah, sounds like the flu. I'm not so worried. 
So now you had to find that balance where you wanted them to care enough about it, uh, but not think, but not be so afraid that they're going to want to leave campus, you know, for the rest of the semester. So it was really, it was, it sometimes can be hard finding the balance. I think that, that, uh, that too, that we, we, we try to all frame all of these um, conversations um, in uh, making sure that we're showing how we, how what we do in environmental health and safety ties to the mission of the university. And how, and understanding, you know, the group, I always make sure to spend some time learning about the group that I'm about to talk to, the people knowing that audience, um, to know what are some of the things that are going to resonate um, with them. What are some of the things that they care about, and and try to focus on how does the, how can I how can I how can I use that in some way and in, in to to be able to make my point, and I think that you know communicating all across the most important thing is is as much as possible to know who your audience is and know what works for them, and you're gonna have to you can't just take this, if something is important. You can't just take, you know, one or even two ways to describe something, to to um, to talk about something. You need to look at at least three, four different viewpoints for that for that um, for that particular issue. So, because you won't necessarily know which is the one that is going to um, is is going to mean something to them, uh, and. You know, I find that I found that when I was just when I was you know, years and years ago when I was just doing lab inspections and and I would say to so, so this lab, you know, you're going to be fine if you do if you do this. And well, well they don't care. Um, it's uh, pouring down the drain, you know, it's going to hurt the environment. Well, we, we don't care. But the oh, if you collect it the right way, it gets used for fuel um, fuel blending. It's like oh, well, that's cool. Now I'm going to do it. You know, so you just don't know. And then too often we kind of stop at one after one or two tactics. When for these really serious issues, especially, you, you need to, to go at it and, and to communicate it in many different ways. That reminds me a lot of, uh, David, what you said earlier about persistence. It sounds like, you know, for most cases, when you're really busy, you see something once, you see something close, you think, okay, I can put this off. But you keep getting an email every single day, you know, week, whatever, however frequently with different language saying this is really important. Uh, you know, just when you're busy, that kind of frequency can sometimes... Uh, equate to importance and help you know guide you towards the things that you really should be paying attention to. Yeah, and then if I could just add one more quick thing, and this is a shout out to Bill Dieselin. Um, um, he uh, a, 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 a presentation that he gave. He he, he uh, mentioned a book that he thought was really important, and I always share this as the most important book that all safety professionals should know, um, and that is um, Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. Um, and that's because if you think about that, you know, he's that Sam I am is saying, you know, will you, will you eat it uh, in a house? Will you eat it with a mouse? Will you, will you try it with a boat? Uh, you know, all, all of these different things. And it's all about persistence and finding different ways to be able to frame the same thing to make what you're doing, what you, what you feel is really strongly needs to happen uh, to have people grab onto that. So. Fantastic. Uh, David, anything quick that you'd like to add here before we transition over to the live Q&A? I think that the, the point about knowing your audience, knowing who you're communicating to, and then figuring out how to somehow make it relate to them, it's hugely important. If you have to, sometimes you have to make it personal. You have to make it something that the person in the leadership role can take to heart because they may not understand it from a scientific or technical point of view. So that, that, that's all I'll add. I think otherwise uh, Robin and JP covered it. Fantastic. So before we uh, kick on over to our live Q&A, uh, just I'm going to launch a quick poll for everybody to respond to. So these are the community connection webinars. You know, the goal here is really to serve everybody in terms of what uh, you are looking for, for topics, for content, for your uh, panelists. So if everybody could go ahead, take a little bit of time to vote on topics that you'd like to see coming up as well as whether you're interested in being a panelist at future webinars. That really helps these to continue going on, uh, especially the panelists. I think there's no shortage of topics. Uh, the more that I do these things, the more I think I'm learning that we just have too much to talk about almost. And uh, really getting more people on here is the challenge. And uh, so again, a huge thank you to our current panelists for donating their incredibly important time today uh, to this event. And I'm going to keep that going as we go on to announce our next upcoming webinars. So please go ahead, feel free to 
register for those. The new uh, EHS community webinar homepage is updated with our newest webinar available, which is going to be all about keeping facilities and maintenance personnel safe. So looking at how we can keep those people who are repairing our lights, working on our HVAC, uh, all the other important support tasks, uh, preventing them from contracting this disease. And we also have one coming up soon uh, in the retrospective on coronavirus initial response, looking back on how we performed during that initial period, seeing what we can learn in case there is a second spike as reopenings continue uh, throughout the country. And then one talking about safety, culture, and trust as we have people repopulating buildings and going back and seeing everybody exhibiting certain behaviors, having a strong positive safety culture where people can help each other stay safe and where there's trust that other people will be taking actions that will keep each other safe is just really critical. And uh, another reminder, so it looks like you all are doing a great job of asking these questions in the Q&A button uh, box down in the Zoom control panel. I definitely recommend that uh, you add your questions there as opposed to the chat, just because it will make it a lot easier for us to address them. You can go ahead and thumbs up the questions you're most interested in. That helps us identify the ones to answer. And uh, you can answer each other's questions. So that way, even if we're not talking about a particular topic, you can still have some really great back and forth. And uh, without any further ado, we're going to get started. Uh, so Michelle, I'm going to just sort of pass right now on the six foot question to stay on topic on communication, but I'm glad to see there are some other people weighing in there. So everybody feel free to continue that conversation. And I'm going to jump straight to Darlene's question. Uh, she wants to know what some tips or suggestions are to gently nudge leadership to provide the transparency uh, to end users. So people like facility researchers, uh, EHS team, core facilities directors, lab managers, etc. cetera, uh, about steps they are taking to get the university ready for ramp up in the new fall 2020 face-to-face uh, -face instructions. So it sounds like uh, nudging leadership for transparency. What are some good ways of doing that when there's something you feel like you need but isn't being provided? I, hey Robin, you want to go first? Oh, go ahead, you go. I, I would just come back to something I said before. So my boss doesn't ever want me to go with to her with a problem. I always go with solutions in my hands. So if I had a suggestion that I wanted more transparency, I would write out exactly what that would look like. And I would probably do three different scenarios on how I could implement that. Um, if it's if it's transparency, though, in the other sense of even I don't know it, I'm not sure I'm not sure that's going to go very far. If it's something, you know what I mean. So the question has to do maybe more about what kind of things are you trying to communicate? Are they things that you have in your in your knowledge area in your safety area, or is it something that even you don't know and you want transparency on? So anyway, that's what I would do. I would I would come up with the solution and present it. And I'll just um, add on to that is, is that a lot of uh, it called a lot of colleges and universities are being very open and transparent with their communications to their um, to their constituents and. Uh, and I would take a look at some of the ones that uh, particularly ones that are that are in your peer group that you consider to be in your peer group to see have they um, have their has their leadership done that have they are there good examples of here's how somebody framed this in in this um, in this great way um, sometimes showing that real example can be even more of an incentive to uh, to consider it. Yeah, I definitely think um, so. I, I I feel what what David was talking about. Um, you know, if, if you don't know, so I'll, I'll address it from that standpoint. If it's something you don't know as well, right? You know, the people below you, they're asking you, and and you're not getting that transparency. Um, the the answer, the question of why aren't you getting it may have a lot to do with it. And like like David said, you, you may not get it, and you have to go uh, understand that they may have. Um, some good reasons for the privilege that they're that they're taking on it, um, and have a little bit of faith that they that they have. Uh, one thing I, I usually say when I when I get that sense myself, it's something I don't know, and I'm I'm getting the groundswell of of it seems like the other people want to know as well, or they want the transparency. Um, to the people that that are bringing up this current concern, I usually bring up the Tom Petty song, "The Waiting Is the Hardest Part," because sometimes it is just. A, a, a factor of the waiting. It's because we're on the waiting side and we don't know, it seems like it's taking so long, uh, where obviously they have a very difficult job. So I try to address and um, assuage and give them a recognition of, of the fact that they're waiting and it's difficult. Um, that said, you know, like David was saying, go with go with uh, solutions. I go up there and uh, I'll try to say, hey, what can, what, inf what information, is there anything I can help you with? Uh, is there anything that you can give to me that I can, you know, 
provide my insight on specific things, not trying to get involved in the whole, whole thing to make it more difficult for you or just to add another person. But also, is there something I can do to go to the people that, that want the transparency and ask for them to give some input and I can help organize and triage and bring that back to you? Is that, will that be helpful uh, to the leadership as they're making these decisions? Um, two parts, it, it gets the information uh, in general, even though they may not have, uh, you know, 80% you know, of it may not be useful for, for certain reasons already been de declined as a, as a path or as a piece of information that's useful for the leadership, but it gives them an outlet for, and it makes them feel like they're part of the process. We're definitely dealing with this at Moffitt is different leadership levels, uh, different levels of, uh, you know, there's people that are off campus versus people that have been on campus since this started. Um, so I think we've, We've experienced kind of all levels of, of the way David tiered it out. Uh, but I think if you go with those solutions, like David was saying, and then uh, give the people some sort of opportunity to speak and, and get something off of their chest, make them feel like they're, they're engaged in some part of the process and remind them the waiting is the hardest part. It really is because it, it's something's coming. Something's coming for sure. I, and I, I want to add something kind of funny to this. I'm sorry, Matt, real quick. No, uh, there's a, sometimes they haven't made a policy level decision and, and uh, they're weighing it. You know they're weighing it. We, we, I'm dealing with this all the time. And sometimes they need to be nudged with data. So we, we've created a return to work training, but we're not calling it that. It's something much more uh, well-branded than that. Um, that we gave, we're giving this training and it's evolving every single day. It's not put on, it's not recorded, it's done in person. We get over 200 people who reply. We take the questions from that Q&A, we, we sit down, we help make answers, we give them to our leadership and we say, here's the questions that your community is asking, here's our suggested answers, but you really need to answer these. So in a way, we're, we're kind of forcing them to, to have transparency. It, it, we're doing it nicely because we need their answers, right? It's, it's like JP said, we're getting them they, they're humans, they like to feel needed, right? We, we need to just make sure we're, they have a job to do, we have a job to do, let's just make sure that we're, we're uh, helping them help us the best we can. Yeah. I'll just add in there, uh, something that I always like doing is you know, framing these things uh, in a format of helping. So saying, hey, you know, we need this thing uh, and I'm just wanted to see you know, how you're doing. Uh, is there anything that I can help you with? What can I do to help you accomplish this goal that we both need and that everybody needs? And sometimes that offer of help is enough to have uh, the person you're trying to reach say, oh, you know, I actually have everything I need. I just haven't gotten to it. Let me take care of that now. And uh, again, I think this gets back to this point we've talked about a few times of persistence. You know, if this is something that's really needed. Uh, you can use that tool to get it heard. But I think, again, you want to exercise some uh, just judgment and perspective on not uh, overusing your credibility to be persistent about everything if it's not really that urgent. All right, so moving on to uh, Miriam's question. Uh, she wanted to know how you address uh, how to communicate when you have an intermediate gatekeeper who is responsible for taking things to leadership, but when that gatekeeper may be reluctant or not responsive in moving things up the chain. Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, that's that's really a tough one. I guess it it really depends on, you know, what is the who is that that next step? Um, who is it that you're trying to get that information to? Um, if it seems like it's a persistent issue, then one way to one way to address it may be to to speak with the gatekeeper to request uh, that maybe the you and the gatekeeper and a person above the gatekeeper could just have a short conversation about what kinds of things, what are the kinds of things that they want to hear know more about? What are some of the, you know, here's, here are the kinds of things that we're seeing. What are the things that you want to hear about? You know, just, just to, because it could be that that gatekeeper is thinking that they are protecting in some way. Um, and, and maybe this is the way to, to, to get around that. Um, or it could be that they're protecting you because they are concerned about what those, uh, what people, how they might respond. So it's, uh, it could be helpful to just understand context a bit more and just open up that, those communication. Yeah, I would add that it really depends on what the issue is though. I, I think, you know, I mean, if it's like an employee issue, an employment issue, you know, you need to go to HR, you need to go deal with the Title IX issue, for example. I think it really just depends on the issue. Yeah. It could be something where you go to the gatekeeper and 
they they either have been told they can't tell tell you something. Mm -hmm. uh, they they may not feel comfortable asking the question. I think it really depends. If it's something that um, I never advocate for going outside of your chain of command, but I think if there was something that uh, that you could get. Um, I have, I've been through coaching and they suggest you have your own personal board of directors. So you have a group of people that, that you can rely on and you have confidence that they're not going to go off and, and like share it. So you go to them and you explain the situation, you tell them what the challenge is and you ask for their input. That way you've got people who kind of know what's happening with you, who can, who can provide that guidance. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It just means that somebody to bounce ideas off of. So, so that's something else I would suggest. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm blessed in the sense that we have all these uh, committees that we're a part of, and it's it, collaboration is a uh, is an expectation. So if I bring something up at a committee, and the, the trust is is I have the trust there with my gatekeeper. So um, if it gets brought up at a, at a committee, they probably heard about it. If they haven't heard about it, I'm I'm bringing it back to them. They um, it's okay. It's, it, we're okay at at Moffitt. It's the culturally we'd like to put things out on the table and and discuss them where they are. Um, but then there's, you know, all the things that Robin and David brought up about, it could be a Title IX issue, there could be things you're not thinking about. So um, you have to look at the reason. One of the things I guess I can bring up right here is this, this idea of um, like the, the Andy Dufresne model of consistency. Like, so we talked about persistence and consistency, you know, Andy Dufresne in the movie kept writing letters to get the, the prison library stocked. And he, you know, he, he wrote them every week. The, the way I like to apply that is I, I, I try to look at uh, something Robin brought up earlier about the different ways you can frame it to somebody. Um, I definitely think if there's a problem, you should be able to ask the gatekeeper, like, is there some, some reason that I'm not understanding? But otherwise, if you can come up with other ways to frame it, where over time you, you say, okay, I brought up this need for a vehicle to transport something. Um, and then they, they don't see the need or it takes a, a long time to, to get them to uh, put the money forth to do it. But if you start to document the places where it would have helped or it hurt not having it, um, in a, not in a, a challenging way, but just to show them the picture, the, 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 the limits and the, and the uh, total volume of the risk or, or what you're trying to solve right there, then you can bring it up, uh, you know, if you have a meeting, let's say every two weeks with the gatekeeper or a natural occurrence when you're talking to them, you can say, hey, look, you just want to let you know there are two cases where people had to use their personal vehicles to take uh, spill materials to a, to a spill. Um, I just wanted to kind of bring up that conversation about the vehicle again. Th things like that where you just you can build those little pieces along the way to, to draw the picture like Robin was saying in different ways to them. And I think that's a, a great opportunity to also go in and say, you know, hey, what could I be doing better to help make these things uh, highlighted to you in a way that need, so that they can get addressed more quickly. And that also helps to pivot the conversation to these things need to be addressed and let's work together to solve them instead of making it an adversarial conversation. Great, and uh, moving on to Jesse's question here. Uh, Jesse would like to know how you would recommend bringing personnel h &S type problems to leadership. Uh, for example, one group in the building uh, diligently wears masks, but another group uh, who shares or is working in the building does not. And uh, just before we get to this answer, uh, Jesse, that's a great one. Uh, we're gonna be talking about that on our health and safety uh, safety culture webinar coming up. <laughs> and uh, thank you for bringing that up right now. Yeah, um, so I think that 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 uh, you know this particular case of first question would just would be is there an institutional policy or has there been anything an institutional expectation about wearing the face coverings there you know in this particular in this particular example it's face coverings it could be it could be wearing safety glasses or whatever it might be um, is there an, is there a policy is there is there something that you can point to that that shows that um, this is an expectation of the institution and not just your opinion um, uh, about something. So I think that's the, that's one thing that can be very could be um, very helpful uh, to know. Um, and I, I guess I'm not quite sure. The looking at the question, um, you know, it's uh, 
I, I would have to understand a little bit more about the context of this. Um, but um, you know, I think that if any time you feel that there is a significant health and safety concern, that you should feel you should feel feel comfortable bringing that up, um, not in a personal way, but just as a here's some th these are some uh, these are some of the things that we're seeing. Uh, and that I think are could be a risk to our institution, um, could be putting other people at risk. Um, there's, uh, you know, you, there's also, I guess you're you're asking about bringing it to leadership, and you know, but um, you, there's also the first step of have you brought it across to those group, those, those people that are not wearing to understand why aren't they wearing those fa those the face coverings. Is there something? Why aren't they understanding understanding a bit um, of, of that more? And what are some of the ways? Is it a, is it an education situation that they don't understand, that they don't know why they should? Or you know what's what is what's the barrier? And understanding those barriers helps you to figure out how to how to break down those barriers so that you don't necessarily have to bring to leadership. What you then could bring to leadership was saw this problem. Here's the way that we that we solved it, or here's how it continues. And I'm concerned that if it's happening here, it's happening in other places. So bring it bigger than something that doesn't seem so personal, but seems you know broader. A couple of couple of ideas there. Uh, for us, uh, so I guess my question would be: Is there a policy that you have to wear it, and then how do you normally handle enforcement? Uh, you know, currently we currently in this moment right now. We don't have to wear cloth face covers if you can maintain social distancing. I won't say whether or not that's going to change, but let's pretend it does, or even the current situation, the enforcement is the hardest part. Uh, so I guess it really just depends on the circumstance and the situation. Um, and we're also Arizona, so everybody had a gun, so I'm not sure if, if people feel confident <laughs> to tell everybody not to, or to wear a mask or not. Um, enforcement. Guys, it's going to be horrible. Just telling you, it's going to be horrible. So, good luck. Get some handcuffs. All right, that's what we've tried to deal with it at Moffitt. We're in that zone where you know we were we had just essential staff for a long time in research, um, and then uh, some researchers started to come back, and it definitely was a institutional policy. It already been talked about by the chief of operations. Um, but it wasn't reaching the, the front line. So the environmental services and the facilities, uh, people that were coming to our buildings wouldn't necessarily wear the mask all the time. A lot of them were doing a good job of when they'd see somebody and they'd be near them, they'd, they'd, they'd mask up. But the, um, it concerned some of the researchers. I got an email about the concern. I, I was fortunate enough to be able to pass the concern on to management for those different groups who I have a good relationship with. Um, uh, and and they had a conversation with their supervisors. The frontline supervisors are key uh, in almost everything in safety, and in this, they're going to be key too because they have to do that messaging to the to the frontline staff. Um, that said, within a couple of days, we happen to have these these online um, town halls where the chief of operations is speaking, and, and somebody brings up a question about this, and he addresses it directly as well. I think one of the keys, though, to the success is I had to pass along the message. So I passed along the message to the environmental services manager and then, but then I walked and I talked to the environmental services manager in our building too, saying, Hey, look, I had to send that message on. I wanted to let you know, cause the emails can come across uh, as terse. Um, I had to send it on. We're still supportive. We're glad you're here. We're, you know, you're doing that human messaging with them and encouraging her that, um, that it's a good thing. And then when I, I made a point, when I, I stayed late one night and I saw one of the environmental services guys, I made a point every time I see them to encourage them, Hey, good to see you. So glad you're here. Um, sometimes I say thanks for wearing the mask. It's kind of I'm I'm more of a feeling than a thinking kind of person. So sometimes it's based on how I feel in the moment. But uh, I try to you know, touch on that human side of it and encourage them after they've they've received that uh, feedback from leadership. Um, some messages are a lot harder than wear your mask, right? Um, so we try to make sure we we do that human touch approach on the, on the backside of it as well. But you have to have leadership. If, if the chief of operations didn't mandate down to management for us, it, it would be going much worse. Okay, so uh, that marks the 4 p.m. scheduled start in time of our webinar. Uh, we do have a lot more questions though, and uh, in the best tradition here, we will potentially be able to stay open for another up to 15 minutes to answer some of these if our panelists have the time. Uh, but of course, if you all have to jump for another webinar, another meeting, uh, other responsibilities, please go ahead and feel free. And thank you so much for your time. I'm sure we'd be hearing a pretty thunderous applause from all of our attendees.
uh, from this one. And uh, thank you again. Yeah, definitely appreciate you guys being on um, here to listen to ask questions and, and part of the conversation. Important part of it. And I do apologize, but I actually do have a leadership meeting at four o'clock. <laughs> so I will have to jump off. Uh, but uh, for anyone, if there was a question that you'd like to ask of, of me, please feel free to, to, to email me. I'm pretty easy to find um, and uh, email a call. And thank you, uh, Matt and everyone for uh, in, including me in this webinar and to David and JP for uh, bouncing off ideas together. It was, it was great. Thank you. Always good to see you, Robin. You too. Thank you. I have five minutes, Matt. Otherwise, I got to go. So. All right. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, thank you both. Uh, let's get to the next one. Uh, so this is definitely a contentious topic. So we're going to try and keep this uh, within the context of communication here and uh, the subject of our webinar. So Lester would like to know what kind of challenges leaders are facing as the result of both the pandemic and the social unrest in the wake of the George Floyd killing. Uh, it seems to me that these two issues are amplifying each other. So there's a lot of tension in the United States and in some cases across the world uh, that can make communication uh, challenging across a number of dimensions. Have you found that that has changed the way that you are talking to people? For us, I'd say it's like adding fuel to a fire because it's just everybody, I think the challenge that we face is, as a society, I'll go to society and then in, at workplace from a communication point of view, but you know, we have a lot of people who are staying at home who you know, have a, more time possibly on their hands. They, you know, we've seen more people unemployed and I think it's just it's like a dry kindling ready to, to go, go up in flames. As a university, you know, we're, we're a hub of, of free speech and diversity and inclusion and, and making sure that we, we allow everyone to speak their mind from every, every, you know, political side. So, you know, you have to just, you have to be ready. You've got the same, you've got issues of people congregating on your space, not wearing, you know, protective gear, you know, well, my cloth face coverings, for example. And how do you deal with that? How do you deal with sanitation? How do you deal with uh, riot control? <laughs> Just on top of everything, it's just like I don't know. It's it's uh, it's incredibly stressful. But I feel humbled that we are. At, I am at a public institution. That that's what we believe in. We believe in free speech. We believe in these things. We believe in um, the right to be able to have a discussion with somebody. Right. Uh, I just think it's incredibly challenging when you have to do it via Zoom and you can't see somebody's face. You know, and it's a uh, it's just a lot of stress on top of stress. Yeah, I'd echo this, the stress on top of stress thing. Uh, obviously, we're, we're all maxed out, and then something incredibly important happens. Um, one of Moffitt's core values is inclusion. So I think that um, that's just made it a, a kind of a no-brainer that we're going to put effort towards this. Even though we're all uh, maxed out, we're stressed, we're, you know, we, we've, there's obvious other things that the time cost is, is costing. Um, it's, it's a, it's a priority for us. It's one of our, it's one of our core values. So they've, uh, we've spent a lot of time. We've had some uh, leaders within the institution address uh, issues and put out messages. Uh, and, and we, we've, we've embodied that uh, includes inclusivity to, to allow for the conversations and, uh, and make the time, uh, make the space for it. I'll just add, uh, there's an article I read earlier on in the outbreak uh, where it was, I think, from the Harvard Business School. I think the title of the article was uh, that feeling you're experiencing is grief. And it talks about uh, how this experience of being in this global pandemic is in some ways a trauma. And what that leads to is just a lot of really complicated feelings because grief processing is very challenging. Um, and there's a really, the quote from that article stood out for me. Uh, they said, we should be stockpiling kindness. And I just love that. I think that right now uh, with the social unrest going on across the country, uh, with the number of people who are unemployed right now, who are stuck in their homes, trying to balance living lives, keeping people safe, keeping their loved ones safe, mental health, everything. Uh, it is just more important than ever to treat the people around you as humans and to offer kindness and to see, you know, before you have a conversation, check in with somebody and see how they're doing. Sometimes knowing uh, where somebody is at, uh, where they're at and a uh, mood at a particular day can really make navigating conversation easier and lead to helping you avoid those instances where you say something that you think should be totally fine, but actually might cause some discomfort 
just because somebody's having a tough day or a particularly hard time right now. Yeah, can I just add one more thing to this? So I, I mentioned that we're doing a tra training every single day. It's live, it's in person. And um, we get questions from a across the board. And our training is very factual. It, you know, it talks about what we've done to prepare it. You know, it gives a lot of uh, like details like that. But the one thing that kind of strikes me is how many people are saying, I'm not ready to come back mentally, emotionally. I, I'm so used to being at home and I'm still afraid. I hear on the news every single day, you know, the, 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 the curve is getting greater, it's gonna hit again. And just that constant fear. And so we actually worked with our employee assistance office to include slides about, you know, turn off the TV, you know, stop listening to the news, uh, get outside and talk to somebody. And that's not necessarily going to solve it, but hopefully it will help reduce your stress. And we, we have resources in there. So I would just say, in, even with all that information, people are still writing us every single day talking about how they don't, they're not comfortable coming back. So, so that's what I would just add there. So, Sympathy, kindness, uh, understanding, knowing that no, not everybody's in the same place, um, and that we just do, are doing the very best that we can. So, but with that, you guys, I'm sorry I have to go. Thank you very much for having me today. It was nice uh, chatting with all of you. So take care. Great, David. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, JP, looks like you are uh, muted there. There you go. I got you. The, the kids were running around in the background, so I muted them. <laughs> for a second to save everybody. Um, the, uh, the concept that David brought up is, is, I think it's fair to bring up the fact that people have been out for a while, you know, whether it's two weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Um, in the Navy and aviation, we had this practice of a, called a back in the saddle flight. So if you're out more than 10 or 12, 14 days, you have to fly with someone who was current. So, um, you know, whether it's through Zoom and those daily things that, that David's offering, uh, or, or maybe even to more directly, maybe it makes sense to have people when they come back on site um, to, to be with someone or have some time with someone who's been on site. Um, just, you know, and maybe that's an opportunity too where you just afford the ability for people to talk and decompress. Um, I think it's a concept worth thinking about. It's a wild idea, uh, just kind of came to mind, but it, it seems like it relates. Yeah, that's a little bit of what we're trying to do with these webinars as well. It's not just have them be pure information dumps, but really places where people can talk with each other, uh, ask questions that aren't just about safety, but about their lives and what people are doing, and uh, just feel a little bit more connection at a time when, you know, many of our events are going digital or being canceled. Uh, we're not seeing our colleagues nearly every day. It's very hard to find those casual little conversations that happen a lot more frequently when you're in person. Yep. Right. Well, Matt, I can do one Great. more if, you, if you'd like. And, um, and then, of course, anybody can make those contacts afterwards. Uh, we've got my contact information. So. Sure. So I can uh, serve one up to you. Or if you want to scroll through the Q&A and choose one that calls out to your heart, feel free to do that. And then... In the meantime, just going to go ahead and uh, re-highlight our upcoming webinars. So we're trying to keep these going once every week or two, uh, depending on the topic, to really provide you with uh, content that will be useful for you and answer challenges that you're experiencing in your day-to-day -day work. So please feel free to reach out to me. We have a form on our webinar page uh, to give me your ideas. I love hearing these things, and it helps guide me towards choosing some of these topics that will be the most helpful for you, our audience. Um, let's go with uh, Jacob Lid Liddell's question. Okay, great. You want to read it off or? Oh, yeah, sure. I got you. So uh, in the initial stages of COVID-19, uh, that one, correct? Yes. Great. Uh, the upper administration was coming to safety and risk management for advice. Being good at what we all do uh, of our recommendations were, oh, sorry, <laughs> being good at what we all do uh, for our recommendations were rooted in the guidance from the CDC, EPA, and now OSHA. Uh, even though our recommendations were based in empirical evidence and conservative in nature, it still seemed like the executive response group always did the exact opposite of what they needed. Uh, it really frustrated them and made them question uh, even why they came to them in the first place. So it sounds like uh, there's this disconnect of going to some of the governing bodies that are providing guidelines and trying to take best practices there and then having that be met with disagreement from uh, an executive leadership group. 
Yeah, so I, I think at, at Moffitt, I have to preface it by saying that we're fortunate in the, in the sense that the leadership defined a couple of resources that they were going to use from the beginning. Um, there's the CDC guidance, um, and obviously uh, OSHA, um, and, um, I think those are, the, those are the two main ones. So we did have a frame of reference and an expectation of where, where they would go. So even when we did give our guidance, we, we figured they would fall in line with, or if we thought the CDC came out with something, we pretty much knew we were going to get communicated about that in the next day or two, whether we were going to do it exactly as or how we were going to apply that. I would say, um, you know, encourage you to stay the course because it, it is a difficult time for leadership and, and for them to ground and root themselves and the frame of reference they're using to make decisions. But in the long run, the decisions will be uh, made on that on that data. They will be made uh, with reason, and over time, it will it'll tend in that direction. We have had leadership come out uh, and and say things that were a little more off the cuff. You know, if if there wasn't direct CDC guidance, they'd come off and say something, and they had to. Uh, reframe it later just to kind of get it back into, oh, well, now that we've thought about it. Um, you know, we, every time I've communicated with them, uh, one of them was uh, this idea that, okay, and because we, we do have a, a focus for the clinical side and patients first. Uh, so a lot of times it's, you, you will, I'm not surprised when we get uh, something that came across the other day where they said, okay, what we want to do in research is when people come back, um, to deal with the fact that we have uh, supply issues for cleaning supplies and we want to make sure it's all going to the clinical side and they have everything they need before any of it goes to, to the research side, um, we should require everybody to bring their own cleaning supplies. So I looked it up and I, I, my suggestion and my recommendation, the way I communicated to them was my recommendation at the top and some supporting information, not all the supporting information for my recommendation that we don't require them to bring their own. Um, was under there. Just the, the three or four key main points that I thought would get traction with them. But then I talked about and I gave a fair uh, representation of what we would need to consider and what we would need to do if we did decide to make them breathe. So what is, uh, what's that hill you got to get over if we do want to do this in a reasonable way? Um, so that I think that approach helped. I was, I was lucky I didn't, I'm not in the situation you were where they, they asked and then it's like, wait, why'd you ask if you didn't do what I, I said the right answer was. Um, they did go in, in my direction over the past two or three of these, but I, I do think that that approach can help if, if, you, if you can look at that other alternative that you don't want them to choose, but then to say, these are the things we'll have to do to do this correctly, or the, the standards we'll have to meet to make sure that we're protecting people the right way or that we're affording legal protections in the right way, which some of it with the cleaning materials was, was a uh, legal issues, right? Hopefully that's helpful. Well, great. That was a really amazingly fast 75 minutes here. So I just want to thank you again, JP, for jumping on here. Uh, yeah. We are going to end our webinar now, but a big thank you to everybody for joining and for participating. Uh, it's a really fantastic discussion. We're going to do our best to get your questions addressed after the webinar is over uh, through the community. And I hope to see you all in a couple of weeks for our next webinar, talking about uh, our retrospective, looking again forward, seeing what we can do better should a second spike, uh, you know, in some cases, maybe when a second spike occurs. So have a great day, everybody. Enjoy the weekend, and I will see you later. Appreciate you guys. Thanks, Matt. All right. Bye.